Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're here for our second installment of uh, talking about the Tamarisk leaf beetle and, and our program. You're going to hear from Ben Bloodworth. Uh, ben is our, uh, our beetle program coordinator and he's going to be talking about the effects of the Tamarisk leaf beetle, Tamarisk mortality, its effects on uh, uh, southwestern little flycatchers and, and other wildlife and, uh, and its interaction and uh, with wildfire. So uh, again, thank you for joining us. This is our second installment uh, and our third webinar that we're doing. We get some more information out uh, in the hands of people who need it about the programs and what uh, Rivers Edge West does. Uh, the program itself uh, was really predicated on getting the information to land managers so they could make better uh, management decisions based on uh, where the Tamara Sleep Beetle is, is moving, uh, it, its impacts, and, and so they can make more informed decisions. Ben, I'm going to turn it over to you. And uh, again, thanks everyone for joining us. All right, thanks, Rusty. Uh, so <clears throat> thanks all of you for joining us for uh, Tamarisk Beetle Part Two. Uh, uh, today we're going to do kind of a more technical dive into the aspects of the beetle and how it's uh, affecting the, the overall riparian environment. And I've combined basically four different presentations from our workshop series. Uh, so I'm gonna be going pretty fast. I uh, tried to get it down to 45 minutes, but it is about four hours worth of stuff. Uh, so if you really want, more detail, uh, probably even more than the question and answer session at the end, let me know uh, through my contact info, which will be on the, the last slide, and uh, we can try to get you more in-depth information on uh, some of the aspects as we move forward. So for now, I'm gonna turn off my video and uh, dive on in here. All right, as we mentioned last time, uh, the beetle defoliates tamarisk. It's very good at defoliating tamarisk, um, but it's hard to predict when uh, that's gonna happen, sometimes where it's gonna happen, uh, and it varies across the landscape. Uh, it can happen in large scale extremely quickly. Uh, you can see here, this is basically a three week period and uh, the entire valley of the Mormon Mesa on the Virgin River was defoliated. So remember, remember this photo. Uh, we're going to refer back to the Mormon Mesa here in a, in a few minutes. So what we do see with beetle uh, is the reduction of the, all of the leaves on the trees, uh, which can lead to branches of the canopy dying back. Uh, it definitely reduces the health of the plant, but may not necessarily uh, kill the plant. Uh, some, we've gotten a lot of information uh, from the Colorado Department of Agriculture. They have several sites set up to look at the effects of beetle over time. Uh, here you can see a tree that looks dead, but is actually not. If you look very close, you can see some kind of yellow to orange leaves there at the base of that dead looking tree and that those are leaves that were defoliated that season. So the beetle does not necessarily kill, kill a tree even though it looks like it may be dead. Uh, this graph here on the top, you can see the open dots are actually canopy. That graph is canopy across two seasons. You can see in the winter, uh, obviously the plants lose their leaves. Uh, those that do not have beetles on them are those open dots and you can see they rebound to basically the state they were the year before, whereas those with the beetles, those black dots, you can see were reduced greatly but did come back with green cover uh, in the subsequent year. So we have sites like this a lot of times that looks like every tree on site is dead when actually none of them are dead. Uh, so scientists have started trying to determine what could be affecting this and whether or not it's the number of defoliations across time. And uh, we found that no, it 
doesn't really seem to have to do with that, that this spot here uh, on the Virgin River, and this is north of St. George, you can see it's been defoliated seven times and has basically 0% dieback. Whereas this spot much lower in the system, it's been defoliated twice and has almost 80% dieback. And looks like this. So this is that uh, Mormon Mesa site we were talking about earlier. Uh, it Throughout the entire Colorado River system, this site probably has the highest mortality of any sites and only took a couple of herbivory events to get it to that point. So one thing that has been determined is that there's a depletion of the carbohydrate reserves that the plant has, uh, as well as the decreased canopy cover I was talking about and decreased flowering, both of which we'll, we'll get to later. I wanted to hit on the carbohydrate storage right now. Uh, so basically, there are kind of two different uh, morphological types of tamarisk. Uh, one that stores energy in the roots uh, from photosynthesis and saves it for a rainy day, um, whereas uh, another form of tamarisk converts that energy immediately to growth, as so they grow taller and faster, and uh, maybe not as thick as some tamarisk that you see. So. Uh, Dr. Holtine wanted to look at this and see if possibly the, the growth rate of tamarisk could be affecting uh, tree mortality and determine whether or not these two different strategies that, that the tree has uh, could be affecting whether or not multiple defoliations affect the tree. So he cut down a bunch of trees that had been defoliated, uh, some that were dead and others that were not, and actually looked at the width of the tree rings and found indeed that the trees with the larger rings, the faster growing trees, were more likely to be killed by uh, defoliation. So when we have tamarisk trees that are fast growing, they're more likely uh, to die after repeated defoliations than those that uh, have different genotypic traits that lead to the carbon storage and saving. So we do see uh, from a couple of different studies that as herbivory occurs, the starch content of the roots drops and the tree loses vigor. Uh, so again, that relates back to how the tree is storing that starch. Uh, so one could theorize that in the long run, after repeated defoliations, that any tree could potentially be killed by the beetle. Um, we may or not may not be seeing that on the landscape, but we do know for certain that as the beetle defoliates, we see a pretty dramatic decrease in those starch levels from uh, 12 to 13 percent of the root mass as those carbohydrate starches. Uh, knocked down to around 2% after um, repeated defoliation. So another thing Dr. Holtine wanted to look at was how salinity and dealing with salinity could affect the plant. As we discussed last time, tamarisk does well with saline soils. Uh, it has the ability to remove the salts from the water that it is bringing up um, from the soil but it does not prefer it. And you may remember me mentioning it's a high metabolic cost. So that metabolic cost comes about in larger cells to transport that water so that the salt crystals can be moved through the water column uh, up into the tree. So trees that do not have cells large enough to move the salts through cannot do well in saline soils. So they, uh, Dr. Holting's lab set up a study to take trees that were from different uh, saline environments to look at those and see how they responded when they were placed in soils of differing salinity. And uh, what you see 
this little graph here is the plants in red uh, came from highly saline soils, and you can see that their photosynthetic rate, uh, how well they're processing energy and growing, increases as salinity increases. Whereas the plants in there in blue that were taken from lower saline soils do not do as well as the salinity increases. So to kind of give you a visual of that, here's what those plants actually look like. And you can see that as salinity increases, the plants from highly saline soils do much better. So these plants have adapted to local conditions and are able to deal with the salinity much better. So uh, Dr. Holding's team also want to look at the difference in some of the plants growing in the upper basin versus the lower basin. And one of the main differences there is the ability to deal with frost. So that plants uh, that have to deal with frost, um, it was theorized that they would be better dealing with other stressors as well, like herbivory or drought. So they rigged them up to a bunch of electronic apparatus and uh, were able to develop this uh, use of water as a predictor of health and see that, um, that the plants that were from high elevation that were able to deal well with frost were also able to utilize the available water better at lower rates than the lower elevation plants. Um, so their team determined uh, that basically, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that plants are adapted uh, to salinity, uh, may not be well adapted to herbivory because they're already using all of their energy to deal with this uh, one uh, constraint in the environment. And plants that are adapted to freezing may be better adapted uh, to other stresses like drought and uh, as a proxy for herbivory. So to that will kind of uh, hint at the rest of the discussion as to where or what we may be seeing and what we could predict in the future because the beetle has been in the upper basin for much longer and most of our mortality data are from the upper basin. So uh, it is possible, according to Dr. Holtine's experiments, that plants in the lower basin will not do as well and not respond as well to herbivory. But for now, we're going to talk about uh, a lot of the data that we do have um, from the upper basin, a lot of that from Colorado. And just want to show you here, these are sites all across the Colorado. They've been looked and you, uh, have been defoliated. Uh, you can see the first year of defoliation and then the percent of that site that is dead. And you'll see that even though defoliation has been occurring for more than a decade, the highest percentage of any site that is dead is 52%. And most sites are much lower than that. So focusing in on Western Colorado, uh, to give you an idea, these are basically a decade worth of data of repeated defoliations. And you can see that most of the sites seem to peak out at a certain level of mortality and stay there. Uh, so even after years of repeated defoliation, uh, Take the plume site, for example, basically it's 54% mortality and has been for years. Across all those sites in western Colorado, you can see that uh, as the repeated defoliation started in 2008 and moved through the next several years, uh, the plants continued to lose um, canopy and uh, branch dieback and then mortality itself 
through across that time uh, until reached about 50 to 60 percent and then just kind of stayed there. Focusing in on a couple of sites, these are kind of interesting because uh, the gateway site has experienced only about 4% mortality and the bedrock site is about 50% mortality. But you can see that the actual dieback and the canopy uh, between the two is very similar. The rattlesnake site you see there is actually a control site that did not have any beetles on it. And you can see that across the 10 years of the study, there was a dramatic increase in canopy cover with uh, no beetles present. So that was uh, mortality. This is a look at the actual canopy cover. You can see there has been a, a decrease in canopy cover across all sites. Uh, average of almost 50 percent decrease uh, that rattlesnake site i told you was kind of like the control site because beetles had never been on it and there was almost a 50 percent increase uh, in canopy across that time and then at the end of that monitoring season in 2018 the beetles arrived at the rattlesnake site and you can see that there was a dramatic decrease uh, in the canopy cover at that site uh, my guess is it's probably recovered a bit, a bit since then, uh, but will be maintained at a lower level now that the beetles are in the system. So you can see that across all these different sites, we definitely have a decrease in canopy cover and some mortality, uh, but the beetle is, even after a decade of defoliation, not even close to killing 100% of the plants. So a lot of people ask and are curious about what happens once the beetles are in the system for a vegetative response of uh, natives. And here's a little information on that. You can see here at this uh, gateway site, which again had very low mortality of tamarisk, but pretty uh, high loss of canopy, that there's very good, uh, this is just passive uh, recruitment, uh, recovery of natives, um, whereas at the bedrock site where we had much higher mortality. See, uh, knapweed is one of the, the big ones to come back in there. Uh, so just a little look at this. Uh, what we have seen from some studies by uh, Dr. Scher's lab is that with passive recruitment, we have seen uh, some pretty good recovery of sites that have more of a natural hydro period and um, get good water flow uh, in spring, um, whereas those that are in highly affected uh, hydrologic areas really need active revegetation uh, to get any kind of natives back. One of the other things I touched on a bit, and you can see here, is that uh, flowers and flowering is dramatically affected by the beetles. Uh, most plants, once the beetles have defoliated them, do not flower again. Uh, even if the beetles leave, they won't flower for a couple of seasons because they're using all their energy to just try to stay alive. So there is a pretty dramatic effect across all sites that we've seen in the Colorado River Basin on uh, cessation uh, or at least dramatic reduction of flowering. With the beetle on the plants, the plants also do not recover well from fire. We're going to cover wildfire uh, more at the end of this, um, but I wanted to bring it in here because it is a definite effect that the beetles have uh, on the plants. Plants usually love fire, and we'll talk more about that, uh, but when the beetles are on the plants, the new growth does not do well. Uh, you can see here, this is a burned area on the Colorado River north of Moab. And the area that has beetles in it is being held much more in check uh, than the area of, you see the kind of dead canopy, but Tamaris is still alive and doing better. And then another site where we had a fire and uh, native willow is now coming back through because 
the beetles have kept that tamarisk from responding to the fire and, and coming back at all. So then just a quick summary of the effects that we've seen, uh, at least in the upper basin or starting to see in the lower basin, is we definitely have cycles of defoliation and refoliation. For the most part, they don't refoliate to the same level. Um, but again, that depends on uh, landscape position and um, the stressor, other stressors on the plant. Uh, there are areas on the Colorado River near Moab that have been defoliated for more than a dozen years. And the plants still look just like they always have because their roots are in the Colorado River and they have all the resources they need to recover. Uh, for the most part, we see a decline in that green biomass, a decrease in canopy cover. Uh, the big one, especially from a management standpoint, if you're downstream of tamarisk, is that uh, reduction in flowering. Um, mortalities really all over the board, and everybody's still working to try to figure out exactly what factors combined with uh, defoliation lead to mortality, and then this uh, inability to cover from fire and recover. So, as I said, I've kind of combined a few topics here to talk about. So now we're just going to take a huge jump and uh, talk about this little bird uh, that is so important to riparian management in the Southwest. Uh, this is the endangered Southwestern willow flycatcher. They are a subspecies of flycatcher, which you can see uh, across the, I'm oh, sorry, the, my red line got shifted there, and that should be in that lower. Uh, but you can see other subspecies in the United States, but the southwestern is the only one that is uh, endangered. Uh, they do arrive later, uh, which can be problematic uh, when involved with the beetle. So uh, this presentation is from uh, Mary Ann McLeod, who does uh, workshop presentations for us. And she says that the bird really is incorrectly named, that it should be called the water flycatcher because it has a huge affinity for water, builds nests near uh, or above standing water. And because of that, needs uh, cool, humid sites uh, with dense vegetation that help maintain uh, the temperature of the nesting sites here uh, in the southwestern desert. Uh, so here are some areas that we're going to discuss. You can see 2008 to 11 is kind of the area along the Virgin River. And then 2017 got down into some breeding areas on uh, the Colorado River and the Bill Williams. So one thing, one reason that the beetle uh, does not necessarily play well with the flycatcher is because of flycatcher habitat preferences. So basically the flycatchers need this dense, humid, cooler than the uh, surrounding desert uh, environment to raise their young, to conceal their nests, to keep the eggs cool, uh, because if they do reach uh, 106 degrees Fahrenheit, they will basically cook and uh, cannot survive that. So when the beetle comes in, uh, it has an effect on the relationship uh, between this vegetation, uh, humidity, temperature, and the water availability. Um, all the water stays, for the most part, because the birds are there for the water. Uh, the vegetation is completely removed, which has a dramatic effect on this temperature and humidity. Uh, you can see this picture here of uh, bird panting because it's uh, so hot trying to maintain, uh, the, trying to thermoregulate in the heat. So that's the big issue with the beetle moving into these areas is taking away that vegetation and cover. So we're gonna look at a few areas where they've moved. Uh, the first is St. George where the beetle uh, was actually released, uh, as we mentioned last week, an unpermitted release in, or last time in 2007 and uh, moved into flycatcher territory and really defoliated the first big year in 2009. 
uh, you can see that uh, fecundity or uh, the young being produced dropped to zero in 2009. But then you also see that uh, fecundity recovered pretty well. Uh, the number of breeding females in the system recovered pretty well. Uh, do notice though that the number of females is extremely low. They, that's the entire population that they monitored is anywhere from four to 12 birds, so uh, females. So, I mean, it is an endangered bird, so there's not many of them out there. But you can see here uh, that the birds, the total number of birds seem to be okay, even with the beetle in the system. And that's because uh, St. George actually has quite a bit of native willow around. It's not just solid tamarisk, and so the birds were able to shift and move their nesting sites uh, to these willow areas. So you can see a huge jump in 2010 uh, to that native area, and then 2011 through 13, basically exclusively utilizing uh, native areas for their nesting sites. So it's not necessarily the tree they're nesting in, but they're nesting sites. Um, so you can uh, again see here that uh, the where that defoliation occurred in 2009, it really knocked knocked them back and pushed them into the native uh, species. So here's the species they're actually nesting in. Um, they prefer the structure of tamarisk actually, and so they nested. Uh, in tamarisk throughout, but you can see that increase in natives uh, for those years of defoliation. Uh, then the beetles kind of um, well, didn't necessarily leave the area, but the def major defoliations occurred later in the season after the birds had moved on, and so the birds moved back into the willow. So by or um, tamarisk, I'm sorry. So by 2018, they were exclusively nesting in tamarisk. So we do see, though, that in St. George, we've got uh, an actual increase in the number of breeding birds and an increase in the total fledglings that are coming off. And a pretty stable nest success. This is a percentage of actual nests producing at least one, uh, one fledgling. You see in 2009, only 13% of the nests produced anything, but uh, got up as high as 80 in 2013. And so the birds are be, have been fairly responsive. Uh, they actually, they are very loyal to their sites. They don't want to move further than 50 kilometers from the sites that they've always used. And so if that native vegetation is nearby and they can move into it, then they're smart enough to recognize something's going on with the tamarisk. We need to go back and uh, go use the willow. So Mormon Mesa, uh, completely different situation. Again, those pictures I showed you where the entire thing was browned out because it's almost entirely tamarisk there, almost no willow. So you can see that uh, after defoliation, the numbers dropped uh, completely off. Uh, there's a gap in there where no surveys were done during the Bundy years, but you can see that basically it fell off and it stayed extremely low on Mormon Mesa. Uh, the birds have not been found to go anywhere else. Um, they just have disappeared because of a complete lack of any kind of habitat for them to utilize. So moving down river uh, to Topic Marsh. Uh, you can see that in mid-May of 2017, it was all green. A um, month later, the beetle had hit. It was completely browned out. Next year, the same. And then by 2019, it had recovered. Uh, so we see the birds reflecting that. Uh, once the beetle hit in 2017, the numbers were already pretty low because of a big wildfire. And um, then we saw the numbers drop completely off, but then rebound again once the, the tamarisk greened up. In the Bill Williams, uh, moving just uh, downstream, we see 
that similar pattern where in 2017, uh, the Beatles hit. We're there again in 18. And then uh, hit mid to late in 19. And again, we see the bird numbers respond to this and completely uh, drop off and disappear. As uh, Marianne always says, this is the doom and gloom portion of uh, the Beetle presentations. So then one more spot just up Bill Williams River to Alamo Lake. Um, we're focusing on this population up here with a circle around it um, because luckily those uh, populations to the west are all within uh, native willow were not really affected by any beetles moving into the into the valley. So in 2017, you can see all the larva defoliating. So it was all gone by uh, mid-July. 2018 was very similar. And 2019, you can see uh, some return to vegetation, but also a lot of what appears to be at least branch dieback, if not complete mortality. Um, one thing that was interesting about this Alamo Lake site was they actually had some data sensors out there looking at temperature. And you can see uh, that in 2016, uh, the year before the beetles arrived, uh, the highest average temperature was about 36 degrees. Um, but you can see that the subsequent year after beetle arrival, the, the median temperature is about 44. If you remember back, it was 41 degrees Celsius was what killed uh, the eggs. So basically any nests that were in this particular area of Alamo Lake in 2017 didn't have any uh, possibility of uh, producing viable young. So what's the fly catcher future? Uh, Marianne postulates that if nothing uh, is done, basically the population will disappear. That once beetles have occupied everything, there will not be enough birds to maintain the population. So uh, she provides some possible solutions. Uh, the first is to try to prevent the best way possible uh, local extirpations of certain populations because they are so site, um, they do have such site fidelity that they will not really jump to a different watershed. So once a population is lost in an area, it's gonna be really difficult to, to get back. Um, so you need to be doing active restoration, uh, not just once the beetle gets there, but the, before the beetle gets there to try to get native vegetation in place. Uh, do it near existing populations, uh, because again, if the population is no longer there, it's gonna be really difficult to get them back because of how loyal they are to their nest sites. And the solution may be easier uh, than we think about with a lot of species because they have such small home territories. So we're not looking at restoring entire reaches of a river um, because the birds have these very small territories that they used. Uh, an example of this uh, is in Lincoln County, Nevada, and we call it the Spring of Pearls, where we have just small patches. Uh, the total size of this area is only three and a half acres um, with some patches as small as a tenth of an acre, yet it supports 17 pairs of birds. Similarly, in that Mormon Mesa site that I've been talking so much about, there are a few little spots right in the middle of that mass sea of dead tamarisk, uh, and they are supporting birds. Um, so there's definite uh, hope for the species if we can actually provide them with some kind of nesting substrate, uh, native willow, uh, that they can utilize uh, if defoliation is occurring. Um, if they have nested 
already, then that season's nest is probably not going to succeed. Uh, but because the Beatles bounce around throughout the season and across years, uh, then there's a good chance if there's native vegetation there, the birds can have somewhere to move to. And they don't have to be big sites. All right, so totally shifting gears again. Uh, now we're going to talk about wildfire and uh, Tamarisco wildfire and the beetles' uh, potential effects on that interaction. So one of the things I haven't really talked about, but one of the things that Tamarisco has brought to our western systems uh, is an increased wildfire risk in riparian areas. Riparian, native riparian areas have always uh, acted as a fuel break. They've been pretty fire resistant um, because they are uh, so wetted and uh, growing in these environments that uh, vegetation itself uh, has proved to be fire resistant and stop fires moving across the landscape. And tamarisk can actually carry fires moving across the landscape. Uh, one of the reasons it can do this is because of its structure. It's the perfect ladder fuel because not only does it have low limbs, but those low limbs hold on to all of the previous year's um, leaves that are dropped in the fall, uh, creating these very high fuel loading structures. Uh, the plants also have an extreme fire behavior. Uh, the Chemical compounds are almost explosive. Um, flame links recorded, as you can see here, up over 40 meters, uh, which is defined uh, as extreme fire behavior, anything greater than 30 meters. Um, so just huge, massive fires. And like I said, the riparian areas themselves are now often carrying these fires because of the tamarisk and no longer acting as natural fuel breaks on the landscape. So all of this uh, research is from Dr. Gail Roos, who has spent a lot of time looking at all aspects of tamarisk and wildfire. Uh, she first started looking to see how the leaves themselves burned and found that tamarisk leaves ignite more quickly uh, than leaves from native vegetation and also found that because of the structure um, which she uh, is called the lacunarity uh, lacunae is greek for windows and uh, the leaves themselves create these air pockets um, we all know back from grade school that fire needs oxygen and uh, this creates uh, this easy pathway to, for oxygen to move throughout uh, the plant and carry the fire. So she actually created an lacunarity index to see how tamarisk compared uh, to natives and uh, found that it had a much higher kind of degree of openness within the tree itself that could carry a uh, fire. So the black bar there is the tamarisk, uh, the white, cottonwood and then two different species of willow there. She also found, uh, she went back and looked at uh, hundreds of historical fires on aerial imagery and traced those that stopped uh, at the riparian corridor and those that the riparian corridor carried and um, found that when tamarisk is present, uh, it is much less likely to stop a fire. Now the fire currents, uh, she did want to note that in this fire currents where the tamarisk, uh, whether it's absent or presence, uh, much of that occurrence is human caused. And a lot of her data showed that much of that was around uh, July 4th timeframe. So go figure. So what does tamarisk and its, uh, propensity to burn mean to native species? Oops. Uh, so she went back and looked at 30 different burns to see uh, 
how much tamarisk was in the system and how that burn affected it. So this was a 25% shorter tamarisk in the understory. You can see the natives are not dead, but they got pretty hammered. Uh, at 50%, a native overstory is uh, pretty much dead. 75% starting to look a bit like a nuclear bomb went off. And 100% tamarisk. You can see all that tamarisk coming back because tamarisk really responds well to fire. Uh, it can grow, well, I've seen it grow 15 to 20 feet in a season after an early season fire. And again, that 100% tamarisk. So it can burn. Um, if you're familiar with wildfire there at all, you can see all that super dark soils where the fire got extremely intense. Uh, so basically what we see is that native fuel consumption in a wildfire greatly increases as tamarisk density increases. Uh, so if you don't have any tamarisk in the understory, uh, not as much native fuel is consumed in the wildfire as when you do. And of course, the uh, mortality uh, increases as tamarisk density increases because the flame length and intensity of that fire increase. So you can see, especially for cottonwood, uh, as tamarisk cover increases, the probability of mortality in a fire wildfire goes up dramatically. Whereas Tamarisk itself uh, responds well to fire and uh, does not ever really have much uh, mortality rate. So Gail wanted to do some prescribed fire experiments to uh, see, uh, she theorized that if there was some way to reduce the tamarisk cover, uh, that maybe it could help some of these things and thought that the beetle and the defoliation um, would be a good thing to test. So she actually looked at, uh, did a couple of different prescribed burns. One, um, uh, where she measured behavior, rate of speed, the flame height, and uh, intensity. So one of these was in uh, the Valley of Fire. Uh, no beetles were present. It was a long standing tamarisk area with that fuel loading that we were talking about. And uh, if you see that tiny little square down there near the cliff, that's actually a wild and firefighter. Um, and this was the results of this prescribed fire they ran. So flame lengths of 35 meters and average rate of spread of almost 40 feet per minute uh, and burned out about 40, 55 percent of all uh, biomass there. So then uh, she went and did the same uh, experiment in an area where beetles had been defoliating for several years and uh, you can see this was what the understory looked like. So some of that uh, dying material that was added each season had been reduced by this time. And these are the results there. An average flame length of just six and a half meters. Uh, rate of spread is almost as fast, 34 feet, but uh, did not, again, remove as much of uh, the existing biomass that was there. But basically this, from a wildland fire standpoint, uh, this is a fire that you could potentially fight versus something that has 35 meter flame lengths. So when she got into it and looked at it, she found that the main reason for the intensity, uh, which makes sense, is the amount of biomass. And that all of uh, those dead ladder fuels, as well as the green biomass in the trees, uh, led to extremely intense fires. So, uh, as we saw this graph before, you can see this change in starch content of the tree. And uh, bringing this up now because uh, Dr. Drews found in her research that 
trees that had been defoliated uh, were much more likely uh, to be killed in the wildfire uh, burning process. And it's not an additive, but a synergistic effect where the sum of these two things is greater than its parts. And she's found that when the beetles are in the system and wildfire occurs, that there is a tamarisk does not rebound. There's a much more uh, dramatic effect. Uh, so this is kind of a, a graph that she developed of what hydrologic functions and vegetation look like. Uh, there on the left side is what it was like before any, the green line is natives and the red line is tamarisk. So the green is the natives before uh, any kind of damming or anything was done in the West. Once that occurred, the native populations obviously started to change. Tamarisk invaded. Uh, as tamarisk started to burn, um, these low intensity fires, because it was only part of the riparian community, it knocked back those natives. Uh, and then as it became a greater and greater part, the more fires, uh, the higher level of intensity, and this idea that eventually all that will be left is tamarisk uh, if wildfire is allowed to dominate. So she theorized that the beetle uh, could potentially change this and uh, create a system wherein uh, both tamarisk and natives uh, could exist uh, with the beetle kind of controlling some of that tamarisk. Um, and maybe even allowing opportunities where the natives in the future could, at least at times, outnumber uh, the tamarisk that was available. So, sorry to throw that uh, graph there on you at the end. Uh, when Gail gives her hour long presentation, there's a lot more going into this uh, fire cycle and riparian vegetation. Uh, but basically, what her research has shown is that once beetles are in the system, uh, we should expect um, frequent fires with extreme behavior in areas following initial defoliation. Um, so basically what she's talking about there is that when the beetles defoliate, the leaves are left on the trees. And so then they're desiccated leaves. So they're actually more likely to start and burn almost as intensely as green leaves. But once those leaves have fallen, which typically takes about six to eight weeks, uh, often dependent on uh, weather conditions uh, like wind blowing them off the trees, uh, then we see uh, that the intensity and frequency drop back. So after that initial year of defoliation, uh, years of defoliation after that will just continue to reduce the, the fire risk. Uh, in these tamarisk dominated areas. Uh, this is an example that she wanted to provide of an area that had been managed. So this is the same exact fire down on the Gila. Uh, the area there that had been thinned, all the tamarisk had been removed from it. And you can see the wildfire swept through. If you look about six to eight inches up on the tree trunks, you can see that burn mark. So it was a very low level fire, just burned off uh, the dead leaves on the, the forest floor. Whereas immediately adjacent where no tamarisk had been removed, it completely burned out uh, the entire uh, native gallery. So what uh, Dr. Drews recommends uh, is maintaining less than 50% uh, cover of tamarisk beneath natives that uh, if you have an area that you're working in, that you need to target uh, those tamarisk areas within native canopies to try to preserve those native canopies uh, in the probably eventuality of a wildfire and dealing with tamarisk. Um, and also for the bird species, they do like these mixed tamarisk stands. Um, Dr. Van Riper recommends 20 to, to 40% of native vegetation, but uh, for the sake of the wildfire side, it should probably be less than 50% tamarisk vegetation to try to get um, those tamarisk and birds and native vegetation to all work 
uh, long term without burning out the incomplete uh, riparian area. So I know there's a ton of information and I blew through it pretty quickly and it still took me 50 minutes, but uh, that's what I've got for you. Thanks, Ben. Uh, appreciate all the information. Um, we have a few questions here. The first one is Holtine's paper available to the public? Um, I'm not sure, but shoot whoever is asking that, shoot me an email to my contact there and uh, I will check with him. I'm sure he'd, he'd be happy to provide it if I can. Okay. Um, another question that we have is, is the ability of tamarisk to recover following fire influenced by soil salinity? Hmm. I don't know. I would, I would assume um, because uh, Dr. Holtine's studies did show that it, it's a pretty high metabolic cost that uh, the plants are under stress in highly saline conditions. So I would assume that they would not respond as well uh, to fire than those in non-saline soils. But I don't know of anybody that's looked at that. Okay. Uh, do you know what effect uh, wildfire has on beetle populations? Uh, if wildfire uh, hits while the beetles are there, it uh, will will wipe out the population. Um, the same is also true of early season flooding uh, because the beetles drop down into the litter to hibernate over the winter. So if uh, spring flooding comes before the tamarisk is really leafed out and they come out, then, then they'll be washed away. But yeah, any major, um, kind of landscape level events like that can wipe out a beetle population for sure. Yeah. Um, this next question, it says, considering the future of the willow flycatcher, do you think Diarabda would be approved for release uh, today in the U.S.? Um, um, Fernando McKay sent that question in, is uh, the, the beetle is, uh, and has been released in the U.S. Just to be clear, uh, Rivers Edge West does not do beetle releases. Our program is focused on gathering information uh, about uh, the presence absence, where it's moving, a lot of what been presented today uh, to provide that to land managers so they can make informed decisions. Um, but uh, Ben, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about um, what the uh, the the regulations are about releasing beetles uh, in, in the U.S. currently? Sure, and I, actually I probably should have, since we were talking SWIFT, I probably should have mentioned that. Um, I talked about a little bit in the last webinar, but uh, it was recognized that the beetles uh, would have an impact on um, southwestern willow flycatcher habitat if they ever got there. Uh, so the original permitted release uh, was a um, had stipulations that you were not allowed to release beetles within 200 miles of a known uh, willow flycatcher nest in Tamarisk. So at the time, uh, all the early studies in the field in Nevada showed that the beetle would only move about two, maybe two miles a year. Uh, so the thinking there was that even if the beetle um, evolved to move uh, farther south than expected, it would take a hundred years for it to do so, and and um, we could figure it out. Uh, once they were released in the environment, uh, they can actually move 30 or 40 miles a year. Um, so that dramatically reduced it. And then the beetles, because they had such massive populations, evolved pretty quickly and ended up moving much farther south uh, than the original beetles that were released were able to do. Uh, so. All of those things were considered for the original permit, um, but once in the environment, uh, yeah, the situation changed a bit. 
Okay. Uh, our, ne our next question is, is uh, when there's a lot of dead tamarisk from beetle kill, does the dead wood need to be cleared? What is the appropriate process for that? Mechanical, chemical, uh, mechanical, even fire. Uh, Deidre, yes, um, there, there are instances when uh, there is standing dead or at least the kind of the skeleton of the tamarisk is there. Um, there are instances where aesthetics and, and that the dead tamarisk does need to be removed. Um, generally that is done um, either mechanical or by hand crews with chainsaws. Uh, you know, there, there's masticators and, and hydroaxes that, that can remove that pretty efficiently if there's access to those, uh, to those areas. Uh, the appropriate process for that, um, you know, if, if the tamarisk isn't, um, uh, if the tamarisk has been defoliated by the beetle, it generally means that, as, as Ben presented, it, it has weakened the plant. It, it's used its, uh, you know, it's, it's using its reserve to stay alive because it can't photosynthesize uh, food. So it is in a weakened state. So uh, there can be a chemical and mechanical means for controlling that, um, you know, where you can actually get in there if it's been defoliated. Uh, you, you do, we are finding that there are uh, higher percentages of, of mortality when we control weakened tamarisk than we have in, in really good stands. So I hope that answers your question. And, and I don't know if you have anything to add on that. Oh, no, I think you got it. Okay. Um, this is from William Patterson. Do tamarisk populations in a defoliated state offer opportunities for supplemental active restoration activities? Um, I might take a shot at that, Ben. Um, yeah. You know, uh, yes, I, I think that there uh, there is opportunities for revegetation or active restoration in plantings. Uh, we are actually uh, and have tested on on several uh, river systems, uh, removing. 50% of the canopy and leaving 50%. So it creates that microclimate. It doesn't, uh, it, you know, the soil isn't uh, exposed directly to the sun and uh, native plants can can actually kind of utilize that, that those microclimates. And so it, I think the same holds for uh, areas that uh, are, are being defoliated. Um, you know, that does allow sunlight to penetrate uh, deeper down, uh, you know, through those canopies. So the, the, it, there can be um, um, uh, opportunities for active restoration in some of those sites. Uh, very site dependent though, uh, as, as many of our uh, uh, things that we talk about are. So I think that there are some opportunities. Um, another question is, is there a, a, a uh, an average or uh, how far does the bezel move in instance per acre per year, um, acres per year? Um, ben, I know, I know we have some, some data on how fast and far they can move, but do you have any answers to that? Um, I, don't, I don't know of anybody that's looked at it in acres per year. They, they will move, uh, depending on, so they have basically six week generations and depending on where you are and what species, uh, anywhere from uh, three to six or seven generations a year. Um, so they can move pretty easily 30 to 40 miles a year. And if they're moving that far, then they are typically defoliating all every river mile as they go. So it doesn't really matter how thin or wide the tamarisk is, or they're, they're going to defoliate it all if they're in those very large populations that are moving that far. So I'm not sure acres per year, just pretty much every acre that is within their movement, they're they're going to hit. Yeah, and and some of those early tests, like in Lovelock and and in Moab and those areas, uh, they were they could defoliate. Uh, thousands of acres fairly rapidly, right? In, in just a few weeks' time. Wasn't that correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. 
like when they hit the Mormon Mesa area, I mean, they're, oh, I can't remember, something crazy like 40,000 acres there, and they basically defoliated all of it in a month. Yeah. Um, another question says, is BLM releasing any beetles on their land uh, this year in Colorado, particularly in Northwest Colorado? I'll, I'll take a shot at this. Um, uh, the, the BLM uh, is, is not releasing uh, beetles. Uh, however, there are there has been entities that uh, organizations that have released beetles in Northwest Colorado with varying degrees of success. Um, you know, the beetles are, are slow to take hold in certain geographic areas. A case in point is, is in the Arkansas Basin in Colorado and Kansas. There has been multiple, multiple releases for uh, a number of years, and it's taken uh, a long time for them to, to grab hold. Uh, we, we are seeing that in, in some areas of Northwest Colorado. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it's all about the, the beetles overwintering in the area. Will they have food when they emerge? There are certain um, uh, criteria that help them uh, establish in those areas. Um, but, uh, um, you know, the, the, uh, the Palisade and Sectory, uh, propagates those beetles, uh, for landowners, um, in, in the state of Colorado and, and, and land, the private landowners can release those on their property. Is that correct, Ben? Uh, yep. Yeah, and okay. you can actually contact the inspectory and uh, talk to them about coming out and doing a release for you if they deem it's appropriate in your area. Yeah. And, uh, you know, another question on this is, is do they need to be released every year for maximum effect? Um, uh, to my earlier statement, there there has been multiple releases in multiple years in certain areas for them to establish. Um, I, I think that that is based on on how they establish whether you have to keep re-releasing them or, or not. Um, I think some of the things that Ben has presented is these beetles are are, are locally adapting. Uh, so you know the 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 temperature, the the light, uh, the photo period, the sunlight, uh, all the things that they're trying to get used to to establish in these areas. Um, so it, it may take. Uh, a uh, number of times for them to get established. So, um, Ben, it, it, it looks, unless you have anything else, it looks like that's the end of our questions. All right, cool. All right, cool. We would like to again thank you all for joining us for the day uh, and taking time and spending it with us. This is uh, again an, an, another. Uh, section of our webinar. We'll continue to have webinars throughout the year on different subjects. So stay tuned and we will have an, another version for you soon. I hope you all are well. Take care. Thank you.